Hey, this is Ryan Lambert, Rudy from the Monster Squad. You listen to Spoiler Country, for reals. Hey, hey, people of Earth, it's time to enter the Spoilerverse via our secret portal at the exclusive Arctic Club in beautiful downtown Seattle with our hosts, John and Kenrick and Jeff. Welcome to Spoiler Country. Hey, if you're listening to our show for the first time and you're on one of the social medias that we're on, like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, any of those kinds of things, you should always check us out on Spoilerverse.com. But if you want to keep up with our latest episodes, you should bring out your smartphone, get into your favorite podcast here, Find Spoiler Country and hit subscribe. Then you'll get all our new stuff. And if you want to reach out to us, you can do that in two ways. You can call us or use a voicemail at 707-656-2080. Again, 707-656-2080. Or you can shoot us an email at spoilercountry at gmail.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. It's that time again where I did the intro solo and I'm doing it a little differently, but... Kendrick is out because he is busy moving this week, so you're going to have myself and Casey and some other people doing some intros for you this week, some special guest appearances on the intro outro, just introducing some of these awesome interviews we have for you today and all this week. But today on the show, we got the really cool, really amazing, from the Monster Squad, Ryan Lambert, coming on to talk about the Monster Squad, his career, and, and all this all this fun stuff that he's done in his whole life. And Jeff Haas, Jeff the Get Haas, sits down and chats with them. And they chatted for a long time, so long, in fact, that we have two episodes for you today. So here, without further ado, is the first part. Hello, listeners of Spoiler Country. Today on the show, we had the fantastic Ryan Lambert. How are we doing today, Mr. Lambert? Fantastic, I guess, according to you. <laughs> I'm the fantastic <laughs> Ryland. Well, I, I will say I'm a, a huge fan of yours. I'm a kid of the 80s, so you know that means Monster Squad for me. <laughs> sure. And, and looking back on some research I did on you, you're an, not only just an actor, but you're also a musician as well, right? True. More so, actually. You know, I, my professional acting career was maybe, let's see, 12 to about 19 and then i quit to play music because I, that's yeah. what i i really wanted to do re- all along even from the beginning and so from 1989 or something like that to hmm. present day I, i'm a musician i mean i've been in i've been in multiple bands and recorded and i have albums out and toured and rehearsed after you know everyone got off work every day and three times a week in our own rehearsal space in LA and San Francisco and that's kind of what I've been doing I mean that's not I that is exactly what I've been doing acting was a really small portion of my younger years and now I'm back in LA from San Francisco after 15 years pursuing that world again good timing too (laughs) So, and, yeah, and unfortunately, you picked the one time when no one's unfortunately able to go to tours, I guess, anymore. Ooh, right, right. <laughs> have, have you considered doing either a virtual tour or what I've seen in a few places, they do the social distancing type of audience. Have you considered that or is it basically, I mean, once you have those, that few people with social distancing allowed in a space, maybe it's not worth, you know, doing the concert. I time. would do that. I would do that. There's so many obstacles right now that have absolutely nothing to do with virus at all really i'm i live in la now and my band is in san francisco kind of spread out a little bit because this incarnation of this per- particular band kill moi was a big band it was it was a, a four-piece band with a three-piece horn section so it was a little odd at, on a stage uh, especially when you're playing like small san francisco venues when i lived there you know, we would, we would tour and, and play shows around town all the time. But at this point now, it's like, oh, this guy's over here, that guy's over here. <laughs> and everyone's sort of spread out and also in different projects as well. The band isn't technically broke up because somehow 
uh, among this whole catastrophe that's happened in 2020, we're managing to put out a record. <laughs> it wasn't recorded in, well, part of it was recorded in January, but a lot of it was recorded like years ago. So no. we've been sort of messing with it and, and, and mixing it and mastering it. And I went up and did some more vocals on it and got a few uh, virtual horns to come in from their house and record and then send the files to our producer and, and put it all together. And it's being mastered as we speak right now. So uh, I'm not sure if we're going to put that out in December or I'd like to put it out in, in 2020 because I think that's, I don't know ironic or something is, but is, is, is this the first new album since hold me motherfucker came out yes so this is not thematically necessarily but we're calling this one no seriously hold me motherfucker <laughs> so it's a bit of a sequel in the sense that it's like kind of like this band is sort of wrapping up its little tenure or whatever so we're gonna put it out i just listened to like the final mixes a couple nights ago and I'm pretty proud of it. It's different. It's definitely maybe not everyone's taste, but you know, we tried really hard to stay away from like our indie rock roots as far as like, you know, playing the one note through the whole thing, just droning on and on and, you know, shoegazing mm. emo shit. Not that I ever really yeah. did that, but most of the bands we played with were like that. I wanted to do something a little more grandiose, kind of throw back to like wings or, Billy Joel or even something like that, or, you know, Neil Diamond even. Uh, my band made fun of me because it was sort of like my project. And they were like, really? And like all of our other bands have always been just us playing music. It's like, now we have to really mm. concentrate on things and give a lot of space to other instruments and other sounds and things like that. Whereas, you know, when you're just playing in sort of like a punk band, it's just like, when do they ever, when do they ever go? And everyone just starts playing, you know? Yeah. This was like, you know, you pull out here, you don't do anything here, just like leave this breath open. And so it, was, it, it took a lot. The first Kim Wall record was like that too, but this one really kind of takes that sort of concept into the stratosphere. Now, one of the things, like I said, I did have some questions for, uh, about your band. One of the, the album I, I did, um, I really do like is uh, January's, or the song, sorry, the song is called January, sorry. Yeah. And the, one of the lyrics I, did, I really did like on that song, you said, or I don't know if you're if you are the writer of that. I know you're. I think two people are listed on under lyrics on, for it. Oh really? Who's the other? Um, <laughs> That's all me, I believe. I usually <laughs> I'm, I'm usually the sole lyricist, and I usually bring a lot of like you know skeleton versions of songs, and then we sort of piece them together. But mo but mostly like as a band, we do that. You know, we kind of just come up with stuff or someone brings something in i'll start singing over it so melodies occasionally uh, i'll bring a full song but mostly lyrics are are, are from my own wacky brain yeah and, and like so and with the lyrics i think it was really interesting you wrote you said i or you wrote i got everything but I never had january's and i think that's a great lyric and i was wondering what you uh went by where that lyric originated from that idea of i never had january's I think, well, I'm sort of a uh, subconscious writer. I don't think like, I'm gonna write about this thing and write a story about that particular subject. I think it's more like, I have the melody already in my head. What's gonna fit in that melody? What can I use and what emotion am I feeling as I put the pen to paper? Sometimes it takes me, you know, a month Sometimes it takes me six months to write lyrics. Sometimes it takes me an hour. It just kind of depends on it. But I've never been to. But I've never been to January's. I, you know, I think that particular song is about sort of like finding a new person in your life and maybe trying to do something that you've never done before. You know, whether it's like, hey, I'm going to be domestic now, or, you know, we're just going to be tr world travelers. Who knows? You know. And, and so that like representation of like, you've never done something before. I thought January's was kind of like a perfect, it, it, it kind of fit the melody at first. I think I had that word mm. first, like da 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 January's. I thought like, you know, it's a recognizable word, which is always good in songs and things like that. Whenever, when someone hears something that, you know, it's like, I know that word. <laughs> yeah. 
or that's my birthday or something. <laughs> you know, like, it just kind of hits you in the gut. But like, I think for the most part, it, it's just, you know, I've never done anything in January. Nothing ever happens for me in January. Let's try something new. That, that's cool. And when you are doing your writing, are you disciplined like you write at this time of the day or is it when oh, the inspiration hell no. hits you? Hell, no way. I don't have a set that time. I mean, I do that with like sometimes if I'm like writing a screenplay or something, I'll say, you know, set this time aside as like a job and do that. Music is completely different for me. You know, I'm one of those kids that like I always tell people like, you know, when they say, I want to learn to play guitar, I'm like, luck <laughs> like no you just learn and you just i got one and now i'm gonna just learn it's like yeah, yeah yeah but there's so much more to just like sitting down with a teacher or like a book that you have or you're listening to other songs and trying to emulate them if you want to actually learn to play like that thing needs to be in your hands all the time like just twiddling around on it while you're watching a movie not like trying to like play a song or anything but just have it in your hands have your fingers on the strings, have the pick in your hand, or if you're not using a pick, have your fingers on the strings and just always have it with you. Like that's how I don't really do that too much anymore because it's like, I kind of know how to play as much as I want to. I don't, I'm never going to be hmm. fucking Eddie Van Halen. So like, <laughs> no, I mean, who can, but I don't, I'm not, that's not my style of playing anyway. I'm a rhythm guitar player because I'm like the lead singer and the, you know, so I, I leave that, those jobs up to like real guitar players. But, you know, if you know three chords, <laughs> three chords in the truth, you know, you can play whatever you want. Yeah. Play any song in the world. Uh, um, play any Bob Dylan song for sure. But, you know, I, I, yeah, it, it, I don't have a disciplined uh, set time for writing music, but at least, you know, once or twice a day, there's always a guitar like sitting right next to me. It's actually, right now it's my new ukulele, <laughs> but which is shaped like a watermelon, which is really cool and painted like one. It's really weird, but, but <laughs> it's just there. And I'll you know I'll go, oh hey, what's up, buddy? And like I'm watching like you know, you know the the, the new season of Bl like Bly Manor or whatever, and just like plucking on things or whatever. And then if like something, if I hear a chord, I'm like, oh wait, I'll like pause whatever I'm watching and go, I think I got something. And then that's how that comes out. Now, in, in the age of, obviously, cell phones and everything else, do you ever record yourself in case that inspiration hits before and you, need to, and you want to go back and try to pick up on it? Or is it, you know, are you able to just like to remember what you're doing at that moment? I've probably, I'm not sure, but I've probably exhausted the memory on my like voice notes. <laughs> I don't even know how much you could put on there, but it's like, it's going like, hey man, I think you should delete some stuff. Like go back to like, you know, 2011. Get rid of some of the stuff. It's over. <laughs> no, I actually like I, I, I record. Yeah, I do a lot of voice notes stuff. Sometimes I'll just write down chords and like write a little description. Like it's in this time, it's in this signature, and it's, it sounds like I don't know. It, it sounds like the soundtrack to Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and then I'll I'll know that I'll be like, oh, I know what that sounds like. So I'll go, oh yeah, oh it's oh these are the chords. If I'm being too lazy to hit a button on my phone and record it for real. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, one thing I always tell my students, because I'm a high school English teacher, mm. and what I always tell them, yeah, what I always tell my students about writing is that normally if you want to be a good writer, let's say if you want to be a good poet or novelist or short story writer, comic book writer, whatever, lyricist, you want to develop yourself in other writing genres as well. Do you write anything uh, when you're not doing lyrics? Do you like do you do poetry? Do you do other types of writing as well? I do a lot of sh I, I do some short story writing, but that's kind of just for myself, almost as practice for life. I, I write screenplays. I, I've written a few screenplays before. I write a lot of short short films. You know, I just come up with an idea, and I'm like, "Ooh, yeah, that's eight pages. I got this." And I'll just <laughs> rip it out and then send it to a friend, and they'll go, "This is great," or they'll say, "This totally sucks. You should throw this away." Or we can fix, or let's fix this. I know how to fix this. The ending is terrible. Let's do that, whatever. But yeah, my, yeah, I don't really like, I mean, you were asking if like I go outside of like genre or whatever, or who I, like mm. what, what I usually do. I think my themes are pretty consistent. Like I'm not going to sit down and go, I'm going to write a science fiction Western. If I did, it would like have a theme inside of it that I actually was trying to tell. Yeah, and it would just be sort of that setting, I guess. But uh, for the most part, I like you know, 
people always ask me, you know, because I guess I'm like in the horror world, you know, from when I was 15. <laughs> so everyone thinks like, yeah. oh, you're a horror guy. And I'm like, I've never written a horror thing in my life. Like, <laughs> I, I, I like, you know, I, and people like always, like, oh, it's Halloween. You must be watching all the Halloween movies. I'm like, no, I'm uh, watching uh, Cassavetti's Marathon right now. You know? Yeah. Things about people. I like stories about people. And, you know, believe me, I'm very versed in the horror world, the film and, and novels and, and literature and things like that. So I'm there. I got it, you know. But I don't need to, like, see uh, Freddy versus Jason again. Like, yeah. And I don't mean, like, again, like, for the second time, I mean, like, oh, I'm watching this because it's just what it is. I don't really like this movie, but I'm a Halloween nerd, so I'm going to watch it. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> okay, I don't really get that thing, but there's, you know, I think I saw once there's 11.1 billion films that have been made. Seriously? Yeah. It's, it's insane. It seems, it seems higher than I would have thought. I know. I was freaking out. I'm like, oh my, because someone once told me I was at a party and they're like, I'm going to make it my point to watch every movie ever made. I was like, hold on. And I looked at my phone. I said, you're going to watch 11.1 billion movies. <laughs> <laughs> I go, you'd have to so watch first- like 50. You, you probably have to watch like 500 movies a day or something. It's like, that's insane. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Like Osmandius in a Watchmen, you have multiple TVs going at once. What's that? Like Osmandius in the Watchmen movies where you have multiple screens <laughs> playing at once, different things. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of Lewis Scott. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I think it's kind of cool. On your on the website, killmoybandcamp.com, you do have the album. It looks like, because I was listening to it for free, all the, all the albums. I think that's fantastic. When your new album comes out, are you going? Is it going to be also available on your site? Where are they going to be able to find it? Actually, that's something that we are talking about right now. It, it, we're definitely putting up on everything that we can: iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. All those will it'll go up on all that. We haven't really decided if we're actually going to like, you know, print up CDs yet. At this point, it's like I don't know why. It's like that, that doesn't. Yeah. Seem- I mean, there are like, you know, collectors in this world that like to have the thing in their hand. You know, I I know a lot of kids that like, you know, I've got three walls of VHS. I'm like, why? (laughs) Like, you're insane. Um, But I get it. It's a collection thing. And and that's what they like. So they like to see it on their shelves. You know, this kill wall record, that kill wall record, you know. So if they have both next to each other, I understand that. But we don't have any plans to actually print anything up uh, physically. But... It'll be out on everything. If you like, follow us on whatever we, you know, Facebook and things like that, or just follow me on Instagram, which is Ryan Lambert one one one. You'll see the, you'll see it. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where to find it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing I, I noticed, maybe I, I just didn't, you know, this wasn't good at the search. I did not find anywhere where I could read your the lyrics. Is that available somewhere, or is, would that be made available so the lyrics to your album? Is, is readable for us not that i know of but someone actually tried to get me to do that can you write up all the lyrics I'm like oh <laughs> <laughs> like I take pictures of my notebooks i mean i don't know that might be even cooler but you won't be able to read it <laughs> <I'll have some laughs> scratches and chicken marks but like not there there's nothing now from anything that i've done in the past and maybe that's a good idea to do on this new one and just have it available somehow also i think when you do those like when you sign up for those sites, you know, Spotify, Amazon Music, iTunes, Apple Music, I mean, and like, you know, they, they ask for that. Like, that's one of like the things you can give them. And wow, they, I didn't like, know that. Files. Yeah, because if you're if, when I'm listening to Amazon Music or something, like you can hit lyrics and they'll just, they'll scroll with the song. So I think that's like an option that you, you opt in on if you want it. Yeah, I must admit, as I'm one of those music listeners who, if there is a song that I like, I do want to read the, the lyrics, partly okay. because I enjoy it, but also from my perspective as well. Sometimes I don't know if I'm hearing the lyrics quite right. I like knowing, you know, this is exactly, you know, what is in the in that song. Absolutely, I, I've, I've been I've been surprised a few times. <laughs> so, of course, always. Oh my god, like, I mean, that, there's like there's a few out there that are you know so well known for being like the wrong lyrics that people sing constantly. I believe there was a book a long time ago called, excuse me while I kiss this guy. 
<laughs> <laughs> and then it had like all of the then like pages of like lyrics and the right lyrics and then what people thought it was or something. But you know, I'm, I write the lyrics, I sing the lyrics, and then they're for you. You you do what you want with them. I, I don't care what the <laughs> song is about. It's about whatever the fuck yeah. you want it to be about. I honestly, yeah. like I, I, I'm not gonna, you know, you, I'm not Elton John or Paul Simon in that sense where it's like this is about this, and you can kind of tell it is. I'm yeah. not here to like tell you a tale. I'm just sort of kind of trying to like evoke an emotion as a whole, as a band, as, as all the music and the lyrics and the and the vocals are kind of just part of that. It's not trying mm. to like, you know. I mean, a perfect example of that is is Tom York and Radiohead. I mean, put on a Radiohead record and you write down the lyrics. <laughs> Tell me what you think he's <laughs> and what you think that song is about, because you ain't gonna, yeah. you're not gonna know. And you'll never know because he doesn't. Now he's never going to tell you. Yeah. yeah. The flip side of that is Oasis, where it's like you know maybe dating myself, I guess. But like Oasis isn't that long ago, is it? Nineties. <laughs> yeah, nineties. Um, and they're still around, not as a band, but like they're separate projects. But you know, I remember seeing an article, uh, an interview with with one of the Gallagher brothers, and they were talking about the lyrics, and he just shrugged and said, "I don't fucking know." Like, what's Wonderwall about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it just like the lyrics just work. Like you just put in words to fit the melody. I kind of yeah. like that too. Kirk Cobain, Kirk Cobain did that too. It was all like stream of conscious stuff, you know? And then he kind of pieced things together and took lyrics from other songs and put them in this song because it fit better in this song. And he just kind of put it all together and then it made sense to him. Yeah. Th th there was a band in the 90s called Fuel. I don't know if you know who they are. They were on alternative rock for a while. Say Fuel? Um, Fuel. Yeah, I play. I think I played with those guys. Oh yeah, yeah. So they, they have a song. Oh, that's awesome. They have the song they that they wrote that for the longest time I really liked it, but I, I understood it as Jesus wore a gun. I was like, that's a really cool visual. And then I finally <laughs> saw the lyrics, like, oh, Jesus wore a gun. That's a totally different song. <laughs> yeah, completely different meaning. Yeah, absolutely. I wrote a lyric once that said, "Jesus works for dimes with long blonde hair." <laughs> and I had a woman come up to me in a show once and go, it's so beautiful when I hear you speaking of Jesus. <laughs> and I couldn't, I didn't have the heart to like tell her that is absolutely not what I meant. I was actually singing about a homeless man on the corner of my street who thought he was Jesus. And, but you know, <laughs> but I was just like, Oh, okay. Thank you. That's wonderful that it touched you in that way. Like, if that's, yeah. what it, if that's what it does for you. I mean, it, you know, if I would have said, um, you know, that's not what it's about, Karen, or whatever. Yeah. Then, like, you know, that sort of ruins it for her. That's not what art is about, you know. It's, it's about your own interpretations of things. I mean, you can listen to The Boxer by, you know, Paul Simon and tell me that it's about this thing. And I'll be like, great. That's not what I get from it. It's like, no, that's actually the story, though. Like, he's actually telling the story. I'm like, I know, but... I th I'm thinking of something else when I hear that song. Like, it, it, it evokes another emotion in me that, like, it has nothing to do with what he's saying. So, I don't know. It's all interpretation. It's whatever the hell you want it to be. It doesn't matter, as long as you like it. So, so there's a whole segment, potentially, of the population that believes Killer Moy is a Christian rock man, potentially. Kill Moi. It's Kill Moi. Sorry, my, my mistake. Moi as a, you know, the French me. It's also a play on, you know, I'm Jewish. So like, kill me. Ugh, oy vey. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a, a, a population, but like definitely that one woman. And then when she <laughs> played, maybe she played it for her family. Listen to this wonderful song about Jesus. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> 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 that would be pretty funny. People are, you know, singing at singing your music at church. And you're like, this is a, he's a you know beautiful song. So much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're gonna have to just throw in a couple more references to Jesus, just sprinkle throughout the music, just so people can be like, oh hey, see, I told you. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I you know, I, I think on this last record, there's maybe not references to Jesus, but things that you might think were maybe angelic or something that really mm. aren't. I'm pretty sarcastic when I write too. I really like, I, 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 there's not much, you know, there's a lot of truth to what I'm saying, I, I believe, but also a lot of like wink, hearty har, sort of making fun of that situation kind of thing where someone might, you know, take that as something else. 
But again, mm. that's what it's all about. You do you, man. It's all you. I did it already. I say, well, I wrote it. It's yours. You don't have to listen to it, but if it's you, if you want to, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, and, and I, yeah, I think it's great to give your audience that kind of ownership. And I find that a lot of writers sometimes have a similar viewpoint of once you release, it's now yours. And on some level, that's why discerning books, uh, so, sort of with the controversy with Harry Potter with the authors, like, well, right, but now that it's written, it's yours as an audience yeah. member. You can sure. own it in that way. Yeah. I just saw a great video, side note. This guy, a comedian, was explaining how Harry Potter is just a complete, utter ripoff of Star Wars. Oh, okay. Which is really funny because I have the TV on right now and Mark Hamill just popped on right when I said that. Fucking weird. That's insane. <laughs> Not that I'm watching Star Wars. It's just a commercial with the Sir Pat. It's an Uber commercial with a Sir Pat. Yeah. Basically, he was saying like, all right, so this young, I won't, I don't know his act or whatever, but he was saying, but he went down the story just regular. He wasn't saying it was Star Wars or Harry Potter. He was going on the story. And I was like, Oh my God, it's the same fucking, <laughs> it's literally the same story. And then this bearded guy, then he meets this bearded guy and he kind of teaches him magic. And they, later on, he learns magic from a more powerful wizard who seems stoned all the time. And then he, then he meets this uh, girl who he kind of is in love with. There's a lot of tension going on. And, but you know, she's really like suppressing her feelings for the actual like scruffy friend who's the comic relief. I'm like, oh my God, that's fucking Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to see an even more a similarity, check out um, a book by Neil Gaiman called Books of Magic with Tim Hunter in it. Oh, Timothy yeah. Hunter no, as a character. I know the, the game book, yeah, for sure. And yeah, that, I don't, I, mean, I don't see how there's not a copyright issue there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's all based on like, you know, myths and things like that anyway. I mean, you know, you know, you can go read all the old myths. I mean, it's almost the story of Jesus is <laughs> going back to, yeah. we're talking a lot about fucking Jesus on this thing. <laughs> we need to stop that. <laughs> Which is funny considering we're both two Jews. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey man, so was he. Woo! Yeah, that, good point. Very good point. <laughs> so yeah, so we are talking about, it's a very Jewish um, podcast at the moment. <laughs> oh my God. We can, I could go full Jew if you want, but like urban Jew, like Larry <laughs> David Jew. Yes. <laughs> so, what, what, so which of your passions came first, uh, music or acting? Music. I was like a little. Like, I was like a little. Uh, you know, I was in chorus when I was in, like little, like in junior high. I love. Like my dad is like an aficionado of fifties, sixties, and like early seventies rock and soul. Like he, he can tell you who like two who played tambourine on like a Turtles record. Like it, it, he knows everything. So our music, our, our, our house was full of music constantly. The, the record player was going, the uh, dating myself now, the eight track was going when we were flying down the PCH, like, you know, the top down and the wind in our hair. And like my dad's got like Linda Ronstadt blasting on the eight track in the car and uh, Fleetwood Mac and everything like LA sort of uh, Laurel Canyon music, like Tom Petty. And I, he just loved all that stuff. And obviously it introduced me to, you know, the Beatles and, and the Rolling Stones and all that, all, you know, the Who and the Kinks and all that good stuff. But also like everything soul and even jazz, you know, my dad was listening to like Ornette Coleman in the car. I'm like, what is this madness? Like, this is insanity. <laughs> I'm five. Like this is <laughs> like an outer space right now. I remember one time, I, I was laying in my bed and I was listening to, because I had my own stuff too, because I'm a little kid. So I'm listening, I probably like the Grease soundtrack with my giant headphones on, you know, in the 70s. And he yeah. comes in and he's sick of that stuff. He's like, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of this. And he comes in and he puts, he turns, he, he, uh, he takes my record off. He puts on uh, Dark Side of the Moon, side one, and puts the headphones on me makes me lay down in bed and then turns the lights off and closes the door <laughs> <laughs> and goes, I'll be back for side two. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then like the headphones go, and it's like swirling over my head. So I was, you know, I got a shot in the arm when I was really young with music. So when I started to get a little older, I think I was around nine when my when I asked my mom to put me in this like musical comedy troupe thing. And it was after school. 
not had nothing to do with the school. It was like a totally separate thing. It was like instead of going to karate, I went to like musical comedy school or whatever. And we would do, you know, I'm a Yankee Noodle Dandy. You know, and we rehearsed for like, you know, four or five months, and then we would do a show. We would do South Pacific, or we would do, you know, but I'm a little tiny kid, it was crazy. We're doing like, there is nothing like a dame, nothing in the world, you know. And I'm just like this little kid. So I kind of learned to be on stage through that troupe. It was called Bill Edwards On Stage Kids. And Bill Edwards was uh, like my first, was my mentor, really. He, he guided me into what I thought was going to be a career in like either theater or, you know, being in bands, like, you know, playing, playing music live. My, I went out on an audition for a, a musical show because I, because it was a music thing. And I'm like, I'm going to do the music thing. And so I went out on it. And after like three callbacks for it, and like they traveled across the United States trying to find this kid, I got it. <laughs> and it was the only, I had never been on an audition before. And there I was, and I got the fucking thing. And then I was on that TV show for five seasons, Kids Incorporated. That Kids Incorporated? Yeah. So for me, like, it started out musically. The thing is like, oh, I'm on TV. So like, you have to get an agent. And then that agent started sending me out on things that weren't musical. And I was getting all those things too. I'm like, wait. Am I an actor? <laughs> like, what, am I a musician or an actor? I'm trying to be a musician. I'm trying to be a singer. I wasn't really good when I was a kid. I'm like faking it on Kids Inc. As far as playing the guitar, I mean, you can tell I'm totally, totally not even faking it good. Like it looks terrible. But within that process, I was learning to play the guitar. And by the time I was like, you know, 19, I knew how to play. And so mm. that's when I was like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> did all these movies and these TV shows, and now I want to do the thing I really want to do. But I enjoy, I, I love acting. Like, I'm, I'm a, you know, a cinephile. I, I love, yeah. I know a lot more about film than a lot of people I know. I watch at least two movies a day. I'll never get to 11 billion. I, I enjoy it. And that, that's one of the reasons I came back to LA, because I was in San Francisco for 15 years, playing bands, being music. And uh, at one point I was like, maybe I should do a play in San Francisco. That'd be interesting. So I joined the theater company, Shelton Studios. And, you know, I took classes and, and, you know, we did scenes and then eventually I did some plays. And I was like, I think I'm getting that bug. Yeah. And then, you know, the band broke up in San Francisco, kind of. And I thought it was time for me to just come back to LA and, and, and start working again as an actor. And so... No. That's where I am now. So to going back to just a little bit to what, as you mentioned, Kids Incorporated, that you did when you, you started when you were 13, correct? Yes. So, and it was, the cool thing about that show is that it allowed you to act and like, as you said, do, do music. What, what was the experience like beyond that? I mean, because you were experiencing, I imagine, celebrity for the first time well during that show. Yeah. Like after that first season aired, like then it was like Teen Beat City. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, why am I on the cover of magazines? This is really weird. I didn't like. Yeah. I didn't freak out or anything. I, it was fun, you know. And when you're that age, you don't think about anything that, like, the downside of any of that. All you're thinking about is, wow, I'm having fun, and people like what I'm doing, and like, I'm with my friends singing and dancing, and they just have me pointing cameras at us, and, and then they air it on Disney Channel, you know. It was hard to go to Disneyland at that time, around that time. <laughs> it was really hard. Like, I couldn't walk around Disneyland, which was, you know, in hindsight, it's hilarious. Because now I could walk around there and people would be like, get this, like, bomb out of my way, you know. But, uh, yeah, that was interesting. You know, I'd be standing, and you're trapped, too. You're in line, and some, like, little girl goes, is that? No, is that? And then, like, mom goes, excuse me. I was wondering if you were, like, on a show called Kids Incorporated. Like, yes. And then all yeah. of a sudden, like, the other people would come around, and then all of a sudden the security comes and goes, what's going on here? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and they're like, you need to come with us. And then I got to see the whole underworld of Disneyland because of that stuff. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Were you attending school the same time you were in Kids Incorporated? 
Yeah, because we shot in the summer. So when we were done shooting, I would go back to school. Yeah. And then, so, uh, so what was that like in school? Knowing that, you're, I mean, you're technically a celebrity walking around. Was it public school or were you pri- or was it private? It's public. I, yeah, I've only gone to public schools. Uh, well, no, actually, that's not. My last school was private, but that's a whole other actor thing when I was older. No, when I was doing Kids Inc., like, I think I got, I, it was in seventh grade when I got it. So then I did it that summer. So when I came back for eighth grade, I don't even know it had aired yet. So no one, you know, my friends knew. You know, they're like, he went off and did some TV show or whatever with him. Uh, and then and then by ninth grade, it was like everyone knew at the school. But it didn't really change much. It wasn't that big of a deal. I think it would be a bigger deal now. And I, I mean, it also would be a bigger deal if you didn't live in L.A. Like, people in L.A. act, you know? So, like, it's, it wasn't yeah. that weird that a kid went off and, and did, you know, did it professionally. We were in the Valley. We were in Simi Valley, actually. I grew up in, like, proper L.A. in the city as a city kid. And then my parents moved us out to Simi Valley. And so that's where I went to, you know, public junior high. And, uh, but still, it's not that far from, like, the city of Los Angeles. So it wasn't that bizarre. So, and while you were doing Kids Incorporated, you got the role of Rudy from Monster Squad. Were, were you... Were they happening at the same time, Kids Incorporated and Monster Squad? Monster Squad was shot in, I don't even remember, May? I don't even remember when we started that. But it was during my first week of high school. So I was moving from, like, the junior high and then, like, I'm in high school, moving to, like, the big high school, Royal High in Simi Valley. And I was there for a, a week. And I got Monster Squad. And so I had to leave the school. And I actually had to leave the school because they wouldn't give me my work for my set teacher. So we had to find like a school that would do that. And that's when I we talked to a bunch of other child actor parents and stuff like that. And they said, oh, this, there's this little school in, in Hollywood called Excelsior. And they cater to that. They like give you packets to give to your set teacher. And so I had to drop out of like my big, huge high school with a football team and a basketball team and, you know, prom and all that. (laughs) I had to drop out of all that (laughs) to do the Monster Squad just for ninth grade. But I wound up staying at that little uh, private school anyway. Actually, 10th grade was, uh, I went there 10th or 12th grade, you know. Why why were they refusing to work? What's that? Why were they refusing you uh, work, give work to your stage teacher, the, the other school? Because, like, you know, it was like, go around each teacher. Ryan needs his work each week. It's like, oh, what are you, special? Like, why do we have to do this for you? Like, you're not, we're not getting any <laughs> extra. You know, we treat all the students the same. And uh, just because he's going off to work. Like, in, in their eyes, I was leaving the school. Like, I'm not coming to the school. <laughs> like, yeah. but you still want to be in the school? Like, that's not how it works. And so, yeah, I just had to bail. I mean, it was, that's, that's I was crazy. there for like a week. I literally was there for like a week. That, that, that's insane. When um, I teach at a therapeutic high school, and d- especially during this learning, we literally had TAs driving students, um, their work to their house and dropping into mailboxes. Right. I can't imagine the teacher being like, nah, we're not giving it to work. It's not worth the effort. <laughs> yeah, no, this was the 90s. Oh, this was like the late 80s, dude, or whatever. You know, like they don't, they didn't care about shit. Like, these are like... <laughs> much less minimum wage than even the teachers get now. Yeah. And, like they didn't care. I mean, they, I don't even think they do. I think we went to like the administration and asked and they were like, they just said, no, I don't think it was like an individual teacher said, no, it was just like, we're not going to go around each day and get all of his work and put it in a packet and then like ship it to like the teacher on the set of the monster squad. Like <laughs> that's not, that's <laughs> way outside of our, like what we do here, you know? <laughs> 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 that's crazy yeah it it is it, it seems it sometimes when you hear stories like that it understands why some people don't like teachers let <laughs> me some sound like dicks <laughs> <laughs> hey man you know when i lived when i lived in san francisco i worked at a private school i worked in the administration at private school and you know i worked with every department there and also you know knew every student and knew every parent 
because I was so involved with every department. And I really got to see the ins and outs of how, like, how that whole production works. And it, it gave me a completely different new perspective and new appreciation for what, what learning means, you know, and, and the shaping of minds. If, you know, if you're, if you're passionate about your work, despite the being treated poorly in this country, I think that, you know, you can really make a difference. And I've seen it firsthand. I watched kids, I was there for eight years. I watched kids, you know, come and go from kindergarten and graduate in eighth grade. And I saw who they were. Some of them were little shits for sure. <laughs> but like, there were definitely some that I was like, wow, like you were this little crazy little girl in, in preschool, kindergarten, whatever. And now like you're going to go off to this, you know, amazing high school with like, this knowledge that like was you know that you brought on yourself really like you wanted to fill your brain and you did it and you, you got a lot of help doing that i think if we have more teachers like that it would make it all more wild more worthwhile yeah I, I will say as teachers some of us definitely do try it is a tough gig I, oh yeah I you're a teacher student. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, like I said, a high school teacher high school. at a therapeutic school in Providence. Right. Okay. Uh, kids with like emotional problems and whatnot. Right. It, it, it's, it's tough. It's a little, it can be soul crushing at times. But yeah, I, I do, the moments where you do um, have a student who does say, you know, you know, that I inspire them to do something, it, it is, it does feel good. It, you can, you, you carry that with you, like you clutch onto it, like like a, a kid with like a teddy bear. You just hold it onto like that, that saying that you inspired me for like the next year until you hear again. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and it's like I got I've heard it a few times and it's like I said it's nice so that you clutch onto that positive influence that you get from students as well and I don't know if teachers and students always appreciate how much of a give and take it is where teachers need you know it's nice when a teacher hears something positive from a kid and when the kids seem like they're into it it allows the teacher to get into it energizes each other and it's, it's kind of nice in that way sure of course it's beautiful but so anyways so when you were making Monster Squad you were two years older than the other main cast. Was it a kind of a weird situation for you? Because you're kind, you're obviously too young to be around the adults who are, you know, much older, and the kids. You're kind of, even though it's only two years, that's it's between, you know, it's kind of big two years back in, you know, in when you're that age. It was it difficult, or were you able to just fit in completely? Well, I wasn't supposed to fit in. Like that was kind of the point of my character. It was like he wanted to fit in. Offset. I mean, when I first got there. I think I just looked around at these kids and was like, who are these little shits? <laughs> the little fucks I got to work with for a couple months? No, we, we got along really well right away. Andre and I hit it off pretty well. I used to go and shoot like bow and arrows in his backyard. He had like a little setup. And, uh, you know, I, I had even gone to like professional bow and arrow training before the show, before we started shooting. And, uh, you know, it was more helpful just being in his backyard with him showing me you know his techniques and that because he was like a he knew how to do it yeah i don't know he, he, he knew how to he knew how to, andre knows how to do everything <laughs> he was like on he was on the i mean I, andre was like on the his college basketball team like he, oh wow yeah he 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 knows how to yeah he's he's almost you know he's an ad he, he plays golf like every day right now uh, yeah he, he's he wanted to teach me tennis, which I wanted to learn how to do. Yeah. So it was easier to just do do that in his backyard. So yeah, as friends, I think, yeah, it was mostly me and Andre that hung out the most. Brent was very green and wanted to always be involved with everything. And he was such a great kid. Didn't really hang out with Robbie too much. Ashley, I didn't even know she was there. <laughs> um, we've actually <laughs> talked about that recently. It's really funny. Who else was in the Monster Squad? <laughs> <laughs> Who else was actually in the squad? Like Eugene, like he wasn't there for me. Yeah, yeah, I was just kind of, I was alone. I was on my own, basically. Oh. I was definitely Andre was very cool. Um, I actually got to interview him last week. Okay, and he was a, he was a fun a fun conversation. Great. Oh yeah, for sure. He's got stories for for days. Yeah, it was a fun conversation, and like I said, I asked him. You know, obviously, what, what I should ask you. And he definitely said, um, "Ask about the music." I was like, "Definitely." Oh, cool. Right. Thanks, Andre. <laughs> so, but, but as you, obviously, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you played Rudy, and Rudy 
in that movie seemed to be the kid that everyone wanted to be watching that movie. And I remember watching that movie because when the movie came out, I was about seven years old. I might have watched it when I was eight, depending on when my father finally let, allowed me to watch it. Because like I said, I would have been, 1987 would have been seven years old, so he may have held out for a, a year. I'm not really sure. I can't remember that far back. But obviously everyone watching the, that movie, at least who are my age, wanted to be Rudy. You know, you looked up to Rudy. He was the coolest, most badass character in the, you know, in the movie. Was there a particular actor or role you modeled that character after? I mean, it's an amalgamation of all of like what you'd think, you know, the obvious would be, you know, Marlon Brando, obviously James Dean, I think was like the first name that they, they threw at me, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I got it. I know what that is. <laughs> I know James. <laughs> I was already obsessed, but mostly, I don't know. There's an interesting story. If you have time. <laughs> yeah, I definitely got time. Uh, when I went in to do wardrobe for the first time, and the wardrobe woman had, you know, like five or six jackets for me to try on, which one's going to look the best on camera. So she would put one on me and take like a Polaroid and look at it and go, yeah, like this one's good. And then, you know, we'd switch them out, and take a bunch. And then she put this one on me and she said, oh yeah, this is it. This, I think this is the one. I'm gonna think about this for a minute, but like, I think this is the jacket. Let me take a picture. And as she's taking the picture, I'm like trying to move my arms. And I said, I don't know. I don't really feel comfortable in this one. It doesn't feel like something I would wear. And she looks, she like looked me right in the eye, like really close. And she said, you're not playing you. And I was like, oh my God. Like light bulb. <laughs> like, I need to like do some, mental research on this. I mean, I know I'm 15, <laughs> but I know what I'm doing. I obviously got the part in like a big film or what it was supposed to be a big film. <laughs> and it's made me reevaluate who this person was. And so like, yeah, exterior, Marlon Brando and the Wild Ones, James Dean, yada. But then I started thinking like, wait a minute. Like when you think about James Dean's character in Rebel Without a Cause, he isn't that cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> he literally isn't. That's the whole point of the movie. Like, he's just rebelling against his parents and he hates everyone and it has a lot to do with his family and he kind of is a loner. And he gets in a lot of trouble for that. Of course, like, he gets the girl, obviously, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But I don't know if, like, at, in, those, in that day and age, you, you would have said, like, what would he have been like? They would have said, like, oh, maybe he's like Marlon Brando. It's like, Marlon Brando kind of played, like, the toughie, you know? Yeah. He was always, like, leather jacket, he's got the hat, he's got the cigarette hanging out, he's cool. But these guys, this, this character, all these characters, they just want to, like, be accepted. Something happened to them in their lives where they just need to, like, play their, play, they need to make up a character for themselves. And they become this persona of something that they're probably not underneath it all. Mm. So I would say to people that talk about this, you know, when they want to know about this character, I say, take the glasses off, take the cigarette out of his damn mouth, take the leather jacket off and the, you know, the tight jeans, put him in some shorts and a t-shirt and like put his hair down, like cut his hair. Like that, that's probably him. It's just, he, Ryan Lambert was wearing wardrobe, but Rudy is probably also wearing wardrobe. Mm. Because, like, I, he does, why would someone like that, if he was, like, the coolest thing on earth and, like, God's gift to women and all that stuff, like, why would he go hang out with a bunch of children in, in a treehouse? Right, right. <laughs> like, this kid wants to be part of something. Like, I mean, the, the line that I always, you know, antiquate with him, as far as, you know, his, it sums him up perfectly when Phoebe says, I heard he killed his dad. It's like, it's a throwaway line. She's not even on camera saying. It's as I'm like rolling away. I heard hmm. he killed his dad. And it's like, wow. Like there's some stories about this kid that, and, and, and no one knows the truth. But the truth is probably a lot more simpler than you think it is. Would it have been better, in your opinion, or worse if they actually spent time giving him a true backstory? Worse, for sure. Would have been terrible. If there was like a scene when he, he went home and like his dad was like, get over here, Rudy, and like burned him with a cigarette or something. And like, oh, okay, we get it now. He's 
his dad's an asshole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, he doesn't have a family. It's like, he's, you know, he's not Bender from Breakfast Club. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, that guy had a shitty life. And maybe this kid doesn't have a shitty life. Maybe his mom died when he was young. Who knows? I don't know what the story is. Or maybe he just like, doesn't, has like fucking crazy personality disorder. And like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like this is his thing. Yeah. Maybe he's a schizophrenic and this is one of his characters. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to burst anybody's bubble because it's so surfacey rad. It's like when you just watch the movie and you're a kid, it's like, yeah, that kid's badass. Like he's smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer. Like, whoa, that's cool. It's like, yeah, but does he have a motorcycle? Like the kid in the Bad News Bears? Like, why didn't I get a motorcycle? <laughs> like, he just has a bike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I'll say as with for Rudy, I think my favorite scene, and I think that a lot of it had to do with, especially when I first saw the movie, growing up, I was definitely a kid who would get bullied a, a lot, okay? Uh-huh. Which, is a li- which, which is a little bit like uh, Horace, obviously, in the movie. Not for the same reasons, but obviously p- being picked on doesn't really matter what the reasons are. You have Rudy you were, defending you Horace. You were a total again. nerd, probably, right? Uh, yeah, I would. I was. I was definitely the awkward nerd kid. Were you like a hector um, nerd, or were you like a computery nerd, or like movie nerd, like Star Wars beep boop boop guy? I, I would have been since I would have been the eighties. I, I think I was just someone who didn't know how to interact with other people. I was kind of shy and not didn't really just know Got what it. to do. Right. So it was that kind of weird. So I, I wouldn't say I was a computer guy because back then I don't think I even would have been on a computer. And I definitely wasn't necessarily a movie. Geek. I mean, I, was, I might have been a comic book geek how old a you? little bit, but. Huh? So you said six in '87. Um, I was seven years old in 1987, so I'm I'm almost 41 now. I'm 40. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So yeah. So when so at that point I, I would have been bullied. I, I mostly was just an inability to know how to interact with other kids at that point. Right. Okay. So so I was that kind of nerd, you know, and like shy. So and I think and watching that um, movie and when. Rudy comes over and protects Horace from EJ and makes EJ even eat the damn candy. That was one of the great moments in, like, as a, a bully kid to go, good, get that guy, you know? Sure. And it, I think it established Rudy so well as a character. And just that moment made you automatically root for Rudy and you get a sense of him right there. Yep. I mean, when, I mean, there, forget Rudy's backstory as a whole. Like, what's that story? Because he says, I see him at my friend Horace. Yeah. It's like, what do you, what, where did that come from? You know, he's in junior high, you know. How does he know Horace? Like, what's that yeah. backstory? Like, do they live on the same block? Do they live next door? Like, what, we don't know any of that stuff. Why is he defending? Is it just because, or is it because of something specific to do with that particular kid? Does, does he really and, is he protecting Horace? Maybe Horace is his brother. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, well, my, mind, my mind just exploded. <laughs> <laughs> well, the only thing I, I realized in that scene too, which was kind of a big deal, is that Rudy's obviously the tough guy and EJ's obviously terrified of Rudy. But I thought to myself, yeah, but Rudy's tough, but he's hanging around elementary school kids. It Was he tough in junior high around junior high kids? That's you know? <laughs> what I'm thinking. That's ex- exactly, you're on the right wavelength with me. Yeah, we, we're on the same path in that regard. Same thing, you know, it's like, maybe that's why he goes that way. Because it's like, he's the tough guy in this regard, but when he's the other way, he's the one getting bullied at his school, if he goes to school. You know, I yeah. mean, who knows? You know, you can make up anything. Like, the same, we can go, we can, you know, go back to music in that regard, too. It's for you. You decide who Rudy is. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's why they leave it open. I'm just giving you my interpretation. And I'm not, like, saying, like, I said, I... I specifically said these things in my head when I was 15, you know? I just sort of had yeah. this epiphany that maybe I'm not playing, maybe he isn't who you think he is. And yeah, and I, it would change the character quite a bit if he hangs around the, the elementary school to protect Horace um, because, you know, that's where he's, the, that's the only place where he is, like the tough guy. That would change the character a bit. Love it. I love it. I love this. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> go, go. You know, talk to us at uh, Fred Decker and be like, you know, you got to have um, like like a, a mini short where you have Rudy, the junior high years, you know? <laughs> I've talked to Fred. You know, you could, you, you could ask Fred the same question you asked me and he'd just go, interesting. <laughs> well, eventually I'd like to talk. 
Yeah, eventually I'd like to talk to uh, 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 Fred Decker. Um, I know um, in, in about two or three weeks, we have um, Duncan Ryder coming on, on, on the interview as well. Regeer. Regeer, sorry. I, I'm, I, I'm, I really am shit with names. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. I hear. <laughs> And we're back. Thanks, Ryan, for coming on and spending two hours with Jeff and talking to him for basically two episodes for us. We appreciate that. And uh, if you liked what you heard there, if you liked hearing Jeff talk to Ryan, Jeff's been doing a lot of interviews. we got lots of other stuff. We we'll actually have another interview with another member of the Monster Squad coming up pretty soon. And uh, we'll, uh, I'm not going to say who it is now, but you'll know when you hear it. And actually, you'll know who it is because they talked about it on at the end of that episode. So you already know. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to give you a tease, but you've already heard who it is. So we'll just move on. And you know, if you like that, if you like hearing us do interviews or hearing me talk or hearing people on here talk, head over to spoilerverse.com, check out all of our back issues, all of our other episodes of us talking to each other about random topics, us interviewing more amazing people like Ryan Lambert and everybody else out there that we talk to. Also, check out all the other shows on our network with all their episodes. We've got so much cool stuff up there with Bridge in the Kingdom, Misery Point Radio, Funny Book Forensics. There's so much cool stuff up there. Just go get out there and check it out. And while you're there, check out articles and reviews and previews and all the cool stuff we have there. Leave some comments because we love that stuff. And go to the store. When you go to that store, you get a t-shirt or a hoodie or a face mask or a banner or whatever. You'll look fly as hell. You'll help support the site here and help support all the way to not just this podcast, but all the podcasts if you go there and buy, buy something. So go do that. And make sure when you do that, that you